You know, I actually, I learned how to drive a motorcycle uh, in Iquitos, Peru. That's where I, I learned. Any Peruvians in here? No Peruvians in here. Let me ask you another, any Mexicans in here today? Yes. You can all get on, in on this one real quick. Uh, any Californians here today? Okay. I am a native Californian and I am so glad to be back home. You know when I, you know how I knew I was back home here in California? I was at the airport, I went to go pick up my rental car, and I got inside of the rental car and it smelled like medicinal marijuana. I'm not joking. I'm like, I am home. I'm home. You know, Santa Ana Airport, it's like an hour away from here, you know, so I had to stop like three times and get snacks all the way along. I don't, I don't know why. But I'm so glad I'm home here in California. Like I said, I learned how to ride one of these things in Iquitos, Peru. Now, if you're not familiar with a, a, a third world city like Iquitos, um, dry, there, there are roads in third world cities, but there aren't any really rules for those roads, you know? There's just rickshaws and bikes and motorbikes and everybody is just surviving. It's like vehicular Darwinism. It's survival of the fittest and the fastest, you know? You're just holding on. I knew as a foreign motorist that I was going to have to, I was going to have to adapt fast or go extinct, you know? It was one of those moments. And don't ask me why I decided to learn how to drive a motorcycle in this city. I don't know. I think it's being called a male. That's what I think it's being called. Uh, 100%. I just dove in. Now, here's the thing. I walked into the motorcycle rental shop and the guy there, he was, um, uh, he was a total Spanish speaker. He didn't speak any English. So he began to tell me and give me a 10 minute lesson on how to ride a motorcycle. Now, uh, I, I, I don't, um, the only Spanish that I know is what I learned growing up here in California, but uh, I didn't really, I didn't really, you know, it's not really Spanish what we, what I learned, you know, it's not even Spanglish. It's actually, I, I call it uh, Mexifornian. That's what I call it. You know, it's things like this, you know, Simonese. Que paso, huh? You know, things like that. That's Mexifornian and a whole other bunch of words that I can't say in church here this morning. You know, we try to keep it family friendly here, you know. And this was what I knew. And so I was standing there and he's giving me this lesson on how to ride a motorcycle. It's my very first time. And I'm standing there and I understand about 20% of what he's saying. So I'm nodding my head when I understand him and I'm saying, see. Si. See, and unfortunately, I found myself nodding my head and saying see when I totally didn't understand anything that he was saying at the same time. I gave him money, he gave me the bike, I headed out onto the sidewalk right there. You can just imagine it, you know, here I am, I'm on that very, very, whoa, I'm on the very edge you know, of the sidewalk. Right before me, there are scooters and rickshaws and, uh, motorcycles, I mean, just whizzing. I'm staring into the blur of glinting metal that's whizzing inches from my tire. I am stand there and all of a sudden, you know, I pull the bike up. I, uh, you know, I, I tap the, uh, I turn it on. I tap the, the clutch, or pull the clutch in. I, I tap the gear with my foot and I twist the throttle and I go launching out into traffic. And then a semi came and just hit me right there. No, I'm just joking. No, but I, I, I'm headed out and I'm into the street and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make my way and here we are, shoulder to shoulder. I'm literally rubbing elbows with the motorist next to me and we're just going around curves and turns until finally I kind of got my bearings a little bit and I took a sharp right turn out onto a new paved road right out into the Amazon jungle to the most glorious, amazing adventure that was awaiting for me there. But life is just like learning how to ride a motorcycle in a ketose. It's wild, right? I mean, I mean, here's what you, it's dangerous. Life is dangerous. You've got to do things that you've never done before. Did I mention that the motorcycle shop didn't provide any helmets? Oh, just, just a side note there. Life does not come with helmets and it requires you to do things that you've never done before. Life is wild. It's crazy. Okay, case in point, the year 2020. This year has been crazy, right? Is it just me? I mean, it's crazy. It is wild. I mean, we are 
living in the wildest time that I can ever remember. I mean, okay, this has been a wild year for you too, right? I mean, I would hate to be up here and like, it was a wild year, you know, and everyone's up. No, no, bro, it was a banner year for me, sorry. You know, hashtag blessed in 2020, here I am. No, it's been a wild year for us, right? It's been a wild year. And we're going to have to learn how to adapt so we don't go extinct. You know, it's so funny. Um, I was reading my Bible, and um, I came across this scripture, some words of Jesus, and I found that it was really, really difficult for me to relate with them. Jesus says this in John chapter 10, verse 10. He says in the message version, he says, I have come to give you better, you know, real and better life, a life better than you have ever dreamed of. So Jesus is saying to his followers, I've come to bring life. And it's better than you dreamed of. But quite frankly, this year, there have been many moments where I'm like, this is not even the life I imagined for myself in 2019, let alone better than the life that I've ever dreamed of. I mean, Jesus, I'm not really relating with some of the things that I'm going through this year. Jesus, what's going on? And so I want to dig into that a little bit as we go through. You know, people are acting a little bit wild too. Have you noticed that? Uh, people are acting crazy, a little bit crazy. You know, I was in my hotel um, just yesterday, and I came downstairs, and I forgot my mask, okay? Have, has anyone ever for, forgotten your mask, and you've gone out in public, and all of a sudden, there's this lady who's right there, totally confrontational, and she said, where's your mask? You are so insensitive. You know, you are going to infect these kids. You are infect. You see these kids, and I'm like, ma'am, there's no kids there. But if there were kids, if there were kids here, you, you should be ashamed of yourself. Ashamed. And honestly, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, hey, did you break into my rental car and hang out in there for a while? Because you were acting medicinal right now, Karen. No, I mean, you were acting medicinal. I didn't say it. I thought it. I didn't say it, I edited, I was doing better, I was doing better. So, there I was, and I'm standing there, and I can't, I can't blame her. Why? Because, I mean, think about this, where do most of us, especially as followers of Jesus, where do we go when we go through some traumatic things? We usually go to the church. We're like, man, I just need to get, head back to church. I just need to get around, get around my people, and the churches are closed. You know, for me, I like to go and, you know, go to the gym and get some of that frustration out, but the gyms are closed. And so, I, and much of the time, I feel like, you know, I have to be in my house. Stay in your house. Stay where you are. Be isolated. You know, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know, that this is how I feel. I feel shamed into staying in isolation. And you know what? This is the perfect place for us to be broken down and for the enemy to have his way. You know, one good thing about 2020 is I finished writing a brand new book. It's at the editors right now. I'm so excited, yes. I was like, if I'm gonna be inside, I'm gonna do something productive. So I finished this book and it's all about how followers can have this better life that Jesus described, better than our dreams how we can have that better life in the midst of the wilderness that we call the 2020s, 2021, 2022, 2023, because what we're experiencing right now is a traumatic wild event that will not just go away when the pandemic is gone, that there will be an echo that will, an internal echo that will have an impression on us into 2021, into 2022, into 2023, and I've written this book with the idea of giving us in the body of Christ, the followers of Jesus, a guidebook of how to live this better life in the midst of a wilderness and in the midst of a world that is dead set against us living this better life. And so I go through seven characteristics of Christ that we have to adopt if we're going to have this wholehearted living life existence and better and filled existence. This morning I'm going to go into that a little bit. I don't have time to share all seven of these attributes of Christ, but we have to understand that this has had an impact on us in a very big way. 
uh, Barna did a poll this year in 2020, and it said that 54%, 54% of all practicing Christians are, have some sort of emotional slash mental health um, issue that affects their relationships. So think about that for a moment. 54% of all practicing Christians are aware of some sort of emotional slash mental health issue that is affecting the relationships. Okay, let's just bring that home right now and right here. In this room right now. 50% of the people that are in this room right now, half, one out of two, are aware of some sort of of mental health issue. This was this stat was taking this poll was taken this year, 2020. Okay, think about that for a moment. Now let's bring it a little bit closer to home. If you're raised, if you're raising a Christian family, and you're in a home with Christians, practicing Christians, half of your family is maybe aware of a mental health issue that is affecting them right now. Now, now this stat is only, only speaks to those who are aware of it. There's a whole huge percentage of us that don't even know we're aware of it. Some of us, we're, we're, we're in here and we don't understand. Oh my gosh, why do I feel this way? Why am I so anxious about this? Why am I so depressed? Oh, I just gotta, I gotta press through. I gotta get through it. I gotta get to the end of the pandemic. And that's helpful and that's good. But listen, how your brain uh, translates and deals with trauma, it can't deal with it all at the same time, so it kind of just stores it there, it freezes it. And then you've got to go back over time, it can deal with a little bit at a time. So you may be good in the next six months, we may be through this pandemic, and then in the next six months beyond that, all of a sudden, those depression and that anxiety comes back. And if you're not prepared, I just have this feeling that followers of Jesus are going to be confused. That they're going to be like, why, 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 God, I, aren't I just free? Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And God can't do a miracle. I'm just saying, this is how our mind works. And there's an inner life that's inside of us that if we don't understand it, we will be very confused and the enemy will have his way. I believe this is a prophetic message to prepare the church and the followers of Jesus Christ on how to set our heart and our internal world right and ready so that we can walk into this wilderness called the 2020s and that we can have the better life that Jesus promised was better than our dreams. And so today, yes, you can, yeah, you can give it up for there, for that. Today, what I want to do is I real quickly want to just speak about the anatomy of our internal world, what the Bible has to say about it, the anatomy of our soul. I want to talk about that, and then we're going to go into just two characteristics of Christ that are going to help us plant us firm so that we can begin to move forward into that better life, even in the midst of this wilderness called the 2020s. You know, Jesus, uh, speaking of those characteristics, you know, Jesus, he lived the better life in the midst of a world that was dead set against him living that life. And so we have to look to him if we're going to be able to navigate this world in this wild life, in this wild planet, in this wild state that you all live in. All right, so let's talk about the anatomy of the soul just real quick. You know, everyone has a soul. You have a soul. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, Make you holy and whole. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. Do you see that there? Everybody has, you are made up of three parts, very three distinct parts, your soul, your spirit, and your body. That makes up the trinity of you. Now, your soul, one of those distinct pieces, is made up, it's, it's, it's this beautiful thing. All right, it's this, it's this mixed uh, arts kind of uh, beautiful, I mean, it, thing. It's made of your will. It's made of your mind. And it's made of your emotions. So it's this very complex masterpiece that God created. It's of your mind, your will, your emotion, and your heart is all wrapped up in the soul. 
And this soul is the thing that is so valuable that Jesus Christ came and actually gave his life to liberate it. This soul he came to save. Okay, in the center of your soul, this is where it gets even, it gets even better. In the center of your soul is something called your heart. Now, your heart is the throne of your soul. The heart is the throne. So it influences everything else underneath its purview, under its auspice, under its, you know, control and influence. And so if you have a damaged or wounded heart, guess what gets affected? Your mind gets affected. Your thoughts, your emotions get affected. And so does your will. Those are, this is an important and powerful thing for us to understand. Proverbs chapter 4, 23. This is why it says this, above all else, guard your heart for everything you, you do flows from it. You see, our hearts can get damaged and wounded just like you can break your leg, you can have a broken heart. And those of you who have experienced a broken heart, you've experienced how it, is, it has a wearying effect on the rest of your life. If you've ever uh, gone through a bad breakup, if you've ever been betrayed by a friend, a spouse, uh, a coworker, if you've ever bereaved somebody that you've loved and you've lost them, you know the wearying effects that a broken heart has on your life, right? When your heart is broken, your life limps. You, you, you don't want to get out of bed sometimes, or maybe you just, your willpower is gone. How many of you know that? And the thing that you go to, to be able to numb and medicate yourself, whatever that is from, you know, pharmaceuticals to, you know, chocolate ice cream, whatever that is that you go to, to numb yourself. It's why? Because it affects your emotions, your mind, and your will. So Jesus is very concerned about your heart. For those of you who've been around church for a while, where do we invite Jesus into? our heart. We invite him onto the throne of our soul so that he can begin. He saves it, but there's something called, that's justification. He has done it, but then there's something called sanctification that the theologians say, that it is worked out over time that you're healed over time. So yes, you are healed, and God can do a miraculous healing, set you free. I've seen it done again and again. But for many of us, our heart and our soul is a whole lifelong journey to become more and more like our Father. Here's the good news. Jesus came to heal our broken hearts. Okay, this is, okay, this is Jesus's. He's starting his ministry. First sermon, he's giving his mission statement. He goes up in front of the synagogue. It's the church, you know. He goes up there and he opens the scroll and he reads this verse from Isaiah 61, verse 1. He says this. This is Jesus. He's saying his mission statement. Here's why I've come. The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me. Because God anointed me. Here's my purpose. He sent me to preach the good news to the poor and heal the heartbroken. Announce freedom to all captives. Pardon all prisoners. This is what our Savior came to do. This is his purpose. So right now we're in the middle of this pandemic. Yes, there's spiritual stuff going on and we got to deal with that. Yes, there's physical stuff going on, right? When you're isolated, your body, it just, it's not made to be isolated. When you have all this fear and anxiety or this even public shaming, like that one lady in my hotel lobby, you know, all of this stuff is going on and it's overwhelming us. And in the middle of this COVID, I'm just saying, COVID has been a right hook to the heart and, and we have to be able to deal with this and heal from it. You don't go into a boxing match and then afterwards just pretend like, hey, I don't have to, you know, stitch up that cut or, you know, put some ice on here or recuperate. No, we have been in the fight of our lives this year in 2020, and it is going to take some time to recuperate. And today I want to tell you that we have a Lord that came to heal our broken hearts. He came to set things right. The things that you don't even know is broken. You just feel your life limping and going on in life. He came to set you free. This was his purpose. He's a master at it. He's a heart surgeon. And he wants to put your soul back together. And it starts in your heart. Because the heart is the throne of your soul, of your mind, your will, and your emotions. You know, Jesus came to earth 
and he lived that better life, better than, better than you ever dreamed of. He lived that life in a world that was totally committed and dead set on stopping him from being able to live that life. I mean, think about it. He had a king who wanted to care, kill him as an infant. He had to run and be a refugee in Egypt till he was nine. And then he, had, he goes back, and then the Herods are all still there, this family of rulers who were there. His father, Herod, who tried to kill him when he was a kid, now he's given it to his rulership to his sons, and now they're all wanting to kill him, and Jesus is having to navigate. And it's not like Jesus is peaceful going through the fields, you know, passing out flowers and, and you know, patting children on the head. No, Jesus has to be sly, cunning, and slick. His life is on the line, and it's been on the line ever since he was an infant talk about stress talk about talk about stuff talk about him dodging him having to be on alert but yet he lives the better life in spite of it he's the one if we want to know how to do it we got to look to Jesus and the very first characteristic I just want to kind of sink into this morning is this characteristic of Christ that we must have if we are also going to live this better life, better than we've dreamed of life, and be able to experience it in the midst of this wilderness we're call, I'm calling the 2020s. How do we do that? Very first thing that Jesus had deep in his soul and in his heart is he knew he was a beloved child of his father. And we're going to have to know this deeply. Jesus, he's starting his ministry. It's right near the beginning of the ministry. And he's going to get baptized by his cousin John. And he goes to get baptized. And when he gets baptized, this happens in Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. It says, at this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's spirit looking like a dove come down on him. Along with the spirit, a voice, you are my son, pride of my life, marked by my love. Wow. He has this moment. God says, you're my boy. Look, do you guys see my son? Look at him. Look at he's doing what he's doing what I've asked him to do. I'm so proud of this boy of mine, this son, this man. I'm proud. He's marked by my love. He's the joy of my life. I'm so proud of him. Amazing. You know this dove that kind of landed on Jesus during his baptism is the same dove that instantly forces him out into the wilderness to be tested by the enemy. I wonder how Jesus would have done when he was in the wilderness being tested by the enemy, by Satan, if he didn't have that confirming word of his father, to know that he was a beloved child of God sets the foundation for your success in every wilderness of life. And just like Jesus had it, it will be the foundation for us as we go through this wilderness. Because here's, here's what happens. If you don't know that your father loves you and is so just he thinks about you he's for you he's not looking at you saying oh you need to get this together or he's not there trying to beat you over the head when you make a mistake but he's like no you can do this I'm, I'm your number one fan this is my this is my child right here if we don't have that perspective every time we enter into a wilderness season we will see it as punishment and not preparation because when we know our father loves us we're, we're saying god why am i here why is this happening? Why, why, why are you here? And, and our very first instinct for most of us is we say, God, why, did you let, why, why are you letting this happen? And so if you're going to make it, you can't, you can't make it through a wilderness if you think God is a betrayer. And that's what we do. When we have a big disappointment that comes in our life or a series of small disappointments, our natural tendency is to think that God is betraying us and nowhere to be found. And so we have to, that's, the, that's where the enemy loves us to be. And that's where the enemy was for Jesus when he was in the wilderness. But he knew that he was not there for punishment. He knew he was there for preparation. 
God was about to release his ministry. Remember, he was going from the carpenter shop into full-time ministry. There was a bigger, this bigger vision that God had for his life. And so he's going through this. You have to go through the wilderness before you get to that expansive point. And so he's, he's there. And if we, if we don't know that God is there with us, you know, he, he wasn't, the father wasn't speaking to Jesus during that time. The father had trained him, had set him all up to go. It's like, you know, his boxing coach. But, you know, he can't, the coach can't fight the fight for the boxer. So he sets Jesus up, you know. He even gives him the pre-fight pep talk, you know, at the baptism. You're my son. I'm so proud of you. He goes out into the wilderness. And now it's time to fight. And see, he had to go through that before his next expansive, better life began. And so can I just say this today, that God is in a preparation for us as a people, as the people of God, that this season God is not absent. God is not far off. He has prepared us. And listen, we will make it through it. And then when we're done and we're victorious on the other side, he's going to be there to help us heal through 21, 22, 23. And it all starts with this foundation of knowing you are a beloved child. Now, honestly, most of us in here and most followers of Jesus, we don't really believe that God loves us all that much. If we, we don't ever say that from our mouth, but sometimes we doubt it, right? We're like, how, I mean, sometimes I feel like he just tolerates me, right? Sometimes I'm like, I know, I just made a fool, you know? Sometimes I don't edit myself when Karen talks to me that way. You know, sometimes I just, I just let it out, and I'm like, oh, I'm so stupid, stupid. You know, and I think he like, he's like, oh, man, I have had to make so many new ways for you because you just mess up all the time. And, yeah, man, you are, you know, I have special anger angels assigned to you, Joel, because you need them. You need them. I'm like, sorry, God. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm just there, and God, I feel like I disappoint him. But many of us, we feel that same way. And today, I, we just have to know that, 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 well, maybe I'll just prove it to you. How about I prove it to you? Okay. So, um, let's do an exercise together, all of us in here. Do an exercise, and we're going to just stand up all together. It's good to just stand. Just stand up all across this room. Stand all across this room, and I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah, you can stretch out. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, man, you're looking good today. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm looking really good today, though. I just want to let you know. All right, so we're, we're feeling good. We're feeling relaxed. Okay, now, if you feel comfortable, I want you to close your eyes, and I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to let it hit deep in your soul, right? Not just your intellect but into your soul. And here's the question. I want you to ask yourself, how much does God love me? How much does God, don't let it hit your intellect. You know the right, some of you know the right Bible answer. But in your soul, how much does God love me? All right, keep your eyes closed for clarity. Let's quantify that, okay? Let's put it on a, one to ten scale. One being God has no love for you, and ten being God loves you exactly the same as his son, his only begotten, who died, who was crucified, resurrected, and ascended back to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit. That's ten, all right? So now I want you to figure out what, what you felt or what you experienced or what you thought during that question and put it into a number on a one to ten scale. Is it, a, you know, is it a five, a six, a seven, an eight? Where, where, where do you find yourself? Now, I'm going to ask you, everyone, to keep your eyes closed, and I'm going to ask you to do something really brave. If you don't feel comfortable doing it, don't, don't do it. Um, but I'm going to ask you, whatever number that you said, will you just solidify that number, what you said right now? Just make it concrete. Will you just, for my help, so I know where we're, where, who I'm talking to, will you just... Put it up with both hands to show me what number that was. Okay. Okay, I see some, some one hands, some, you know, eights. See some nines. Okay. Some tens. All right, you guys can put your hands down. Okay, you guys can open up your eyes and be seated. Give yourselves a hand for that real quickly. 
Here's the good news. Jesus actually answers this question about how much his father loves us in a prayer that he prays about 24 hours before he's crucified in John 17. So we can all know the answer so that we can leave here and know, okay, this is how much God loves me. John 17, 20 through 23. This is Jesus and he's praying for you, not just you in a metaphorical way, actually for you. Listen to him. I'm praying not only for my present disciples, but also those who will believe in me because of their witness about me. He's praying for us in this room. That's so cool, right? That they, would know, that they would know you, God, love them as much as you love me. <laughs> Jesus' dying declaration is like, God, I just pray that they, that all the believers... In 2020, I pray those, you know, crazy Californians speaking Mexifornian and, and all those other, other I, I pray that they would just know that you love them as much as you love me. And so if you answered less than 10 today, maybe, just maybe, you've doubted God's smitten over the top love for you and so today we've got to let that sink in will you fulfill Jesus's dying wish for you you see some of you right now it's sinking in and you're saying oh my gosh I am a beloved child of God I mean he's crazy about me you know when he sees you when he looks at you and you wake up in the morning, he does that thing he did for Jesus when he got baptized. This is my child who I am so proud of. This is my son. Did you see my son? Did you see my daughter? Oh my gosh, that's her. Oh, do you see that? Oh, she's, oh, he's the, oh, God. He's crazy about you. And if we don't have this kind of uh, characteristic of Christ, this foundation that we are a beloved child of God, not just kind of tolerated, not just kind of like, okay, but you are the top of the top, loved as much as Jesus Christ himself. If you don't have that, then you will go into the wilderness and you will think it's torture and not training. We're going through some stuff, but Jesus went through some stuff too. His father never abandoned him, and our father will never abandon us. This has got to be our foundation. Do you see how we're guarding our heart? Do you see how this is putting on the armor so that when the enemy comes, because there's going to be days, yes, we've gotten that right hook to the heart. So guess what? When we get wounded, when we get punched, when we get uh, hurt or broken, it affects our emotions. It affects our mind. It affects our will, but we can hang on even when we don't feel it, even when we don't uh, want to, even when we're, we're, our thoughts are crazy. We can say, no, I don't understand it today. I know I'm in a wilderness, but my God loves me as much as Jesus Christ. He's not left me. He's not leaving me. He is right here. He has set me up. I have to believe he has set me up to take this on. This is my fight. This is my fight. He is here cheering me on. And guess Guess what? Whenever you need a pep talk, you just go straight back to Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, and you read that, that de declaration at Jesus' baptism as your, as your pep talk. Because guess what? He loves you just as much as he loves Jesus, and he's saying that over your life today. This is powerful stuff. This is going to get us moving forward through the wilderness called the 20. 20s. You know, one other last thought on this subject, and then I'll move to our, our last character trait that I'm going to share today. You know, it's amazing, you know, um, Psalms 139, verse 17 and 18, tells us that God's thoughts for us are more than the sands on the sea. You know, that's a lot, right? Think about how many grains of sand are in just one handful. And, um, you know, um, how many grains of sand on all of the beaches of all the world's ocean? Well, uh, I don't know, but some uh, guys from the University of Hawaii guesstimate that there are uh, seven quintillion, five quadrillion grains of sand on the ocean's beaches. Now, that's a huge number. Uh, it's bigger than, I mean, it's bigger than you could ever really fathom. 
And when you compare it especially to the, let's say, the seconds of your life, right? The seconds of your life, if you live to be 80, it's five, uh, 2,584,600, no, five, uh, 2 billion, 584 million, something like that, 206, 604,000 seconds. I don't know if we even, we even have that number up here. But when you divide that into the seconds of your life, seven quintillion, five quadrillion, the number that you get is that God, and the answer that you get, that God is at least thinking about you approximately three billion times every second of your life. He's thinking about you. Oh, they're getting sick. Okay, all right. Uh, I, we, better, we better get some things, get, some, get them in a the right spot. Oh, you know what? Um, um, they need some extra money. They need some extra food. Okay, we're, okay, we're going to help provide that, and we're going to have you know, one of the P, P12 groups come and just drop off something, and that's going to be the right time. And God is thinking about you three billion times every second. Whoa, what was that? Oh, he just thought about you three billion more times. I mean, God, you, he can't stop thinking about you. He's crazy about you. You're his child. How many of you who have kids and you can't, you, you get to that point where you can't stand them anymore. You are like, yeah, you are possessed. You need deliverance and I need to go in the other room. And then finally you get them to bed and like 10 minutes later you start thinking about them. I wonder how they're doing. You know, I, have a, I had a little video monitor when my kids were, were babies. I'd check in on them, you know, and they're all there, all like this. I, why? Because they're my beloved kids. And even when they act all crazy and they're disrespectful and cantankerous and just possessed, and when, when all of that goes down, I still love them. They're always going to be my kids. I'm so proud of them and God. He loves you just as much as Jesus. That needs to be our foundation. Every other characteristic of Christ is built off of the foundation that he's a beloved child of God. And you are a beloved child of God, just as loved as Jesus Christ. Um, so when you, when you know that your, your heavenly parent loves you, right? And you know you're in favor with your heavenly parent. And then you begin to start to think, well, my heavenly parent created the universe? Oh, that's pretty awesome. It's like kind of, let me give you an example. Something happens on the inside of you. Um, it's like if your father was Bill Gates, right? You would walk a little differently, right? If your dad was Bill Gates, right? And you were like in good, like he loved you. You know, you had influence. You, you wouldn't walk anymore. You would swagger. I mean, you, you, would, you would do that thing. Simone, I mean, you would have that, you would have that walk. You would have that, that, I mean, you would have that moxie, swagger, chutzpah, whatever. You would have it. You would have courage where most people maybe wouldn't have courage. And so what happens when we allow this beloved child characteristic to take root in us, all of a sudden we get a little more courage. We get a little more courageous. Why? Because you're not just talking to any person that's on the street. You're talking to a child of God, yo. You're talking to me, and I just want to let you know, like, I love you. You can put me down. You can do whatever. But you know what? I, at the end of the day, your evaluation of me doesn't mean nothing because I've got a father who loves me. And he made the universe. And so courage is the second characteristic of Christ, and we see this with Christ. He didn't, he, he, he didn't run from anyone. When, when these Pharisees were like, they were like partnering up with Herod, trying to kill Jesus, right? And uh, this, the King Herod, and, and uh, they're like, Herod's going to kill you, run! And he's like somewhere in like Galilee. And uh, Jesus was like, you know, tell that fox. Tell that sly fox. And he goes on and he says, listen, and I already know he's going to kill me in Jerusalem, so it's not happening here, so I'm not moving anywhere. And so some of you, you have people or you have thoughts that come to you and say, you need to be anxious, you need to run, you need to go away. And it's time in those moments that we go back to this first characteristic. I am a beloved child of God. I am loved as much as Jesus. God's thoughts for me are three billion... Oh, 
three billion more. He's, he's there. He's got me covered. And all of a sudden, the courage that we need begins to rise up. All of a sudden, we don't walk anymore. We swagger. We walk into work with that boss who, who has it for us. And we say, you know what? You can't do anything to me ultimately in our minds. You know, you may not want to say that directly to your boss. But, but you, 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 you cannot do one thing to me because God, I am in favor. He loves me. And listen, I have this courage. I have this strength. And it begins to come up in you. Yeah. Begins to come up in you. You know, I have something for you. Um, I haven't done this before, but I want to give everybody in this room a free book. And this book is called Fearless Faith, and it's going to help your courage to rise up. It's going to teach you that, yeah, and you can download it for free today. Today, you can download it for free. It's called Fearless Faith at joeljohnson.org. Just go there. Just go to the front page. You'll see it. It'll say free book. You click on it and you can download it directly. And I want to give it to you as a gift today so that you will not be pushed around by fear, by anxiety, by depression, by anything that would be coming your way during this time. That you would not be intimidated, but you would be fearless in your faith. Today, here's what we're going to do. We've learned a little bit about the anatomy of the soul. We need to know that because we need to know what's going on on the inside of us and that we have a healer of the heart and his name is Jesus. He came. That's his very purpose. We need to know that. So then we can add these other uh, characteristics of Christ who is the Christ healer who showed us and lived a life, the better life, better than his dreams. That better life that he had, that death couldn't even steal that life from him. It was so powerful. It was so profound that it resurrected his body when he should have been down for the count, when it should have been over. He came back three days later. And I'm telling you, you may not be fully back in 2001. You may not be fully back in 2002. But in 2003, I'm telling you, the church is coming alive and the people of God are going to be whole, totally restored. Now, it takes time. And listen, you can be restored in the spirit, you can be restored in your body, you can be restored in your finances, but I'm telling you, your soul, man, I, it, God is doing a work and revealing things, and he's healing and putting back the pieces of your heart. He says he binds them, and guess what? It takes some time to heal some of those things. So there's no shame if you're like, you know, six months from now, let's say the pandemic's over and we're all good and doing that, and you're still feeling kind of like, uh, I don't know, don't, don't. Don't think I'm not, I'm not here. God's not here. No, you are a beloved child of God. You, he is thinking about you. Three billion, three billion, three billion, three billion, three billion. He is all over you, but he has said, okay, this is a fight. And it's not all fun and games when you're in the boxing ring, right? You're going to take some hits. You're going to take some blows, but you're going to keep going. You're going to get back up because God has prepared you. You're not going to get defeated. Like, why did God punish me? No, he is preparing you for something greater. Why is God torturing me? No, he is training you for something better. This is our greatest moment. This is our chance to be able to experience the better life in the wilderness of the 2020s. Here's what we're going to do. If I could have somebody, uh, the worship team, come back up. We're going to take a moment. And I, what I really want to pray over today in just a moment, is I want us to have a supernatural revelation of God's love. You know, the Bible says that when the disciples, they preached the word of God, that signs would follow. Today, we preached a word about soul healing. We preached a word about heart healing. We preached a word about that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. And guess what he wants to do? He wants to bring you a personal sign right now, right here. If you're in this room, if you're watching online, he wants to bring you this supernatural touch that confirms in your heart that you are a beloved child of God. He wants you to experience right now this kind of love where you hear him shouting, that's my boy. I see you. I see you. That's my daughter. Do you see her? He wants to bring that kind of foundation. And once we get that in place, you're going to see, it's, it's not long after that, your courage, your strength. And you're going to step off the sidewalk of yourself and you're going to roar out into the unknown wilds of your soul. Strong, healthy, journeying with Christ, as he says, remember this memory? Let's walk together and heal that.
going to say, Jesus, I invite you in. You know, Jesus said in Revelation 3, verse 12, he's talking to the churches. So this is for us. He's talking to the churches and he says, Behold, I stand on the door, at the door and knock. If anyone would hear my voice and open the door, that I would come in and have a meal with him. Where does he do that? In our heart. So let's say you had a rough time during this time. You lost your job. You lost a loved one. Don't be surprised when Jesus comes knocking on your door. And he can do this through a lot of different ways. He can whisper to you. He can make things really difficult. He can, you know, bad relationships, something. Just he's knocking. He's trying to get your attention. There's something we got to deal with in here. And what you do is you open up the door of your heart and you say, come on in. Come on in and heal that part. Maybe you need to grieve that part of your life, that loss, that loved one, that relationship that you lost, whatever it is, and you invite him in, and he begins to do what only he can do to bind up that heart. And it's when you take care of those things, guess what? You won't have to use willpower as much. You won't have to white-knuckle everything and be like, ah! Why? Because your heart is healed, and it influences your will. Your emotions, I'm telling you, when you allow him to come in and heal, they won't be up and down. One day you're feeling this way, one day you're... No, it's a heart work that begins to heal our emotions. Some of our thoughts go crazy, you know. I, I'm, I'm going to die through this, or oh my gosh, this is, is going to happen. And when our hearts get healed, when we invite Jesus as he knocks on the door of our heart, all of a sudden our minds come back into control and we say, no. I'm a child of God, a beloved child of God. Three billion seconds, three billion times every second. Right now, if you're in here, just a moment, we're going to call you forward and we're going to believe that God is going to meet you in a supernatural way. But before we do that, maybe you're in here today and a friend's brought you. And maybe you believed at one time in God or you kind of have a rough idea of what you believe about God. He's, he's something out there or he's something good or he's the universe or whatever you might, what concept that you have. But if today if you're saying, wow, I've, I want, if Jesus can heal my heart, I want to follow Jesus. If Jesus can take care of this stuff in me, then that's somebody I want to know. And today, if you want to become a Jesus follower, here's what uh, Romans 10, 9 says. It says, if you confess with your mouth, that means if you vow with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, that you would be saved. Man, what a powerful, easy, amazing thing to do to just say, you know, I don't know why I feel this way. I didn't come in here maybe thinking I would want to respond to this, but if he's real, I'm at least willing to go and say, Wow, Jesus, I want to invite you. I do believe this. Come into my life. Change my life. Save my soul. If that's you today, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand. I'm going to just count to three so we kind of know when that moment is. And you can raise your hand up, and we're going to go from there. I'm going to count. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord, you can do it now. One, two, Three, we just lift up your hand. Just say, that's me. You don't have to keep it up. Yeah, just lift it up. Put it down. Now I'm going to ask you to do one more thing in just a moment. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to invite people who want to have this child of God moment with God. You need a touch that solidifies that for you. I'm going to ask you if you just raise your hand to join those that are going to be coming forward. We don't want to embarrass you, but there's something that happens when you take a small step of faith, when you put some action to it. And not only that, but there are people who are here to pray for you, who are anointed. And actually, these guys hear from God a lot. And they may speak the very words that you're looking for, and they'll be able to lead you in that relationship with Jesus. Right now, if you're in here and you say, you know what, I need that child of God experience. I want God to just touch me. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to respond. And, but before I do that, would everyone just stand to your feet all across this room? Just stand up to your feet. And right now, if you're in here and you say, you know what, Joel, I want to have that encounter with God. I need that solidified in me. 
so that my heart begins to get positioned so I can guard it, I can position it so that I can walk through this with strength and confidence. If that's you, would you just right now, would you just join those who raised their hand? Just get out of your seat and come up front right now. Just, just come out wherever you are. You want someone to pray with you to receive that. Just come on out wherever you're at. Yeah. And if you raise your hand, would you join these that are coming up here right now? Don't be embarrassed. I promise. We're not gonna, I'm not going to, nobody's going to call you out. You're going to meet somebody right now. Yeah, come on. Come on. We're going to sing this song. We're going to begin to pray and uh, pray over you and our prayer warriors up here are going to begin to pray for you. Let me pray over the, the whole congregation. Here we go. Let me pray. Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus and we are asking for you to move in a powerful way. We're asking that you would just begin to just bring your revelation of God's love to you right now, to these who are here. God, that, that they are loved as much as Jesus is loved. Let that just begin to sink in. Let that just begin to experience the love of God begin to flow. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Now if you raised your hand and you were wanting to follow Jesus, will you just whisper this prayer right after me that I'll lead you in right now? Would you just say this? We say, God, I give you my life. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins, my mistakes, my broken heart. And God, you raised him from the dead. Now I choose to follow him from this moment forward. In Jesus' name. If you agreed with that, would you say amen? Amen. Thank you guys so much for having me. Amen.